On this episode of Drops of Gold, we are honored to sit with Peter Crone, the mind architect, an individual who's focusing on our human potential. How do we unlock the blocks of our self-limiting beliefs to step into our highest potential? This is all about joy, vitality, and living your life golden. So if you're looking to unlock your highest potential, this is not an episode to miss. Welcome to Drops of Gold. I'm Jeff Skultz. I have been on the healing and revealing journey, following my thread to my inner goal. My great honor in life is to sit with the golden ones and discover what they've released in terms of their past stuck stories, what they've revealed in terms of who they are anew, and within that, how we can each celebrate the art of living life golden. Welcome to Drops of Gold. Hey there, Golden Ones. This episode of Drops of Gold is powered by One Golden Thread, the regenerative nature fashion brand that I created from my mind's eye that we can all live in regenerosity. Enjoy the program, and we've got a special code for you later on to share. You are golden. We are all connected, better together, as One Golden Thread. Brother, this has been a um, a beautiful blessing of a journey that brought us here together. Yeah. So I meet this guy. His name's Peter, mm-hmm. who reached out to me to talk about maybe doing something in co-creation for our various um, lifts that gift in the world or gifts that lift in the world. And he says, "Come out and see me in in um, Santa Barbara." Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. And um, and I have a gift for you. Hmm. I have a door for you. Mm-hmm. A message. I mean, who doesn't get that call? I have a door for you. Could you come and pick it up, please? <laughs> <laughs> that that was uh, one of the most extraordinary invitations mm-hmm. for a surprising, delighting gift that keeps on giving. Because I believe in doorways and portals, and 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 when you handed me, bestowed the door, and, and actually, it is a door. It's 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 a, it's for a. If it was a door, it would be for somebody that would be like my 12-year-old self. Yeah. <laughs> it's maybe 15. Maybe, maybe 17. A big dog. <laughs> it's, like a, yeah. it's, the, it's the most extraordinary <laughs> dog door. Yeah. And the message, the message on it was so extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you remember what it was? Of course. It's one of my pieces of art. I, yeah. So even on your worst day, you're a living miracle. Yeah. 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 And... You know, it's ironic. We meet on many bridges. One of my favorite bridges we meet on is that words cast spells and we can choose our spellings wisely. Mm-hmm. It's that language, you know, is that is that seat that, it, that unlocks. And I'm looking forward to, you know, to diving into um, to that. But I wanted just to share with you, um, you know, I, we, we share the same desire to put words down. And this is one, uh-huh. of, the, one of the ones that I wrote for Drops of Gold. You uh-huh. can read it. This is, when did you write this? This is like... This was written years ago. Oh, okay. Again, the lighting in here is not that good, but you, you read it. It's yours. You are a miracle. You're a miracle. Miracles are messy. Self-permission to make a mess. Nice. So, you know, it's a... It, 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 I'm it, Virgo, so I got to get that. <laughs> <laughs> so... So, I just want to start by saying you're one of my favorite enigmas. Uh-huh. I mean, you're a you're a Brit with perfect teeth. Yeah, that that you're fucks a, everybody. That's why they think yeah. I'm Australian. <laughs> <laughs> you you are uh, you you can't you carry the wisdom, but you always remember to play. You showed up in a Scooby Doo shirt. Yeah. So I love I love the 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 multi parts of you, and I'd love to just. Start by um, you introducing this notion about a mind architect because it means so much um, to to us to realize that if our bodies know the score, mm-hmm. you know our minds can either be, you know, a terrible teacher or a beautiful garden. So mm-hmm. I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about what is mind architecture and what does it mean to be a mind architect. Sure, I mean, uh, you know, just on the most surface level, it's just a moniker, right? It's a sound, it's a vibration, but it creates a space for me to step into and also sort of begs curiosity because if I was walking around as I'm a spiritual teacher or I'm a coach like it's sort of contaminated language I think so words it was sort of the 
invention is uh, the mother of necessity. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like nothing really captured what I was doing accurately enough. So I just saw, well, what am I doing? I'm really working within this space, mind, which most people think is here. It's really not. We're inside of the mind that we think we are. And architecture is sort of speaking to that ability to create new structure, to build beautiful um, containers for what ultimately is our true nature, our soul. So mind architect was just born out of necessity for realizing that everything else never really quite resonated and it already had previous meaning. So it's uh, helping people to, through their own conscious process and perhaps a little bit of inspiration and guidance to recognize the structure they're in is probably overdue for demolo uh, to be uh, demolished <laughs> and uh, torn down because it's limited, usually based in inadequacy, insecurity, and scarcity, and then to give rise through their own architecture, their own conscious creation, something that is a dwelling that they'd love to live within. Stariel Hope said, create containers for things to thrive. Yeah. And it's a very interesting thing to think of your your, your mind as a container, yeah. as opposed to something that's like a river or, or a... Or a a body of water that has no that has no no container, Thanks. and I yeah. love this notion around creating health within. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think just for the audience to recognize, like it's so we use the word pretty much every day, whether it's mind or mental, right? Mental wellness, mental yeah. illness, like oh, what's on your mind? Like, but for me, most people don't know what it is, right? And so when we're speaking about something so consistently, regularly, frequently, but not really knowing what it is, I think it's a disservice because you're wielding this power, but you don't know to what degree you're not actually accessing its potential. So as a very simple analogy, if you live within a 500 square foot studio apartment, then there's only so much that's available to you in terms of that physical space, right? You're not within that space having a conversation through the form of inspiration of, I can't wait to throw the Olympics here, right? Yeah. That conversation doesn't arise in that space, or even I'm going to throw my friend's wedding here with 100 people at a reception, because mm. the space doesn't afford it. So for me, most people are walking around as this boundless, timeless, limitless soul, but suffocated in words that aren't big enough to give rise to the dreams that they aspire to. And it's only because of the containment, the confinement, the constraint of the words that are part of the mind, which itself is limited. Mind to me is just a space. It's what are you doing with the space based on the words that you choose that creates the degree to which you have possibility available to you. So it's like containers are limitless as it being con you know, something that is, it's not confining, it's, it's just con it's container. Yeah, words yeah. become, as I said earlier, yeah. the wardrobe for the soul. Mm -hmm. So words will allow or disallow whatever it is that you aspire to based on the degree to which they speak to limitlessness or they speak to scarcity and confinement. Yeah. I loved um, reading uh, uh, about you going all the way back mm -hmm. and the pure consciousness of the child. Mm -hmm. And I loved it, um, to... to to start there because we all start there and then the world can tell us differently the the can'ts and the shoulds and the things and we this mm -hmm. notion of giving our um giving our our gold away because mm -hmm. we're all born golden i believe mm -hmm. that i genuinely believe that yeah and and so i'd love to hear you talk about that that beautiful essence of um of tapping back to that that pure um consciousness of the child yeah, and I think it's important, especially most of people listening are obviously going to be in their 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond, right? So to be careful, like the gold's never lost. It might become covered or hidden, but it's never lost, right? So it's like Michelangelo when he was asked, how do you create this incredible sculpture of David out of a big lump of marble? And his response is, I didn't. David was already in there. I just chipped away everything that wasn't David. Yeah. So for me, yes, you could say that as kids we arrive or as beings incarnate into this particular life form that we are gold and we are freedom, we are timeless, we are boundless, we are pure possibility. But I would assert in this particular paradigm, we arrive as that is our essence, but then we have our own forms of constraints that we're here to transcend, mm -hmm. right? So there's a certain, I think, naivety of thinking, oh, we're just pure as kids. We, we are to a certain degree, but we're as pure as that when we're adults. It's just we have, quote, unquote, a bigger accumulation of feelings of inadequacy or insecurity or scarcity or constraint. So it's, it's, I think it's 
important for people to understand because otherwise it's sort of an adorning process, right? Most people think, oh, I need to get somewhere. I need to become someone. I need to to overcome or find something. Mm. But then that just sort of perpetuates the idea that I don't have what I'm looking for, but you are what you're looking for. Mm. It's just what's in the way of that. So I, as a catchphrase, I say, I don't solve any problems. I dissolve them. It's a dissolution process. I don't solve any problems. I dissolve them. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Because problems only exist to the identity that you become misassociated with that's not you. Mm. So as long as you're trying to solve a problem, you're actually looking through and from the perspective of the identity that is a facade. It's a survival mechanism. Not wrong. Everyone's got it. It's your ego, your humanity. But beneath that, that has never gone anywhere, that was never contaminated, that can never be lost, is the essence of the freedom, the love, and the pure possibility that everyone's looking for, but from the wrong place. In your personal life recently, or, or you can harken back, where was something that um, your human condition, or they, a human condition would have said the problem that you saw as an opportunity, and that problem just became, an, became a solutionist? Like that for you? Um, gosh, I've been through a couple of things <laughs> recently, um, which has been refreshing, albeit, you know, like when you're in the cauldron, it can be a bit discomforting. Uh, <laughs> even for the mind architect, it's like, damn it. Uh, careful what you're Not walking on water, yeah. What you're <laughs> no. Uh, so for me, just the, the catalyst of love and intimate relationships has always been, for me, the conduit through which I get to discover my own goal, my own freedom, my own sense of true love. And so recently recognizing some of my behavioral patterns that, to use your word, harken back to when I was a kid and my mom was dying of cancer, right? So mm. what I recognize as a blind spot, which is really where the power lies to see what we can't see until we see it. And um, I recognize that for me, as a, uh, even though I was an only child, so I got inundated with attention and love, when my mom was still alive, she was the priority because she had cancer and she was dying. And so what I recognized is one of my patterns was to be the quintessential good boy. No time for me to have tantrums or to, you know, demand my needs be met or I want this or I want that. Like I was always, uh, I had such an incredible ability to, I guess, at some level, accommodate, repress, you know, whatever it is that I was feeling such that my mum got the attention she needed. And of course, it's not a conscious process. I wasn't that, you know... Um, aware as a child it was just a survival mechanism but what i saw just recently in the last actually month or so is that like in partnership when somebody is being in this case quite mercurial and volatile <laughs> you know who it seems like somebody's really upset and angry or whatever they're going through not dying but to that part of me i recognize oh like okay there's a lot more commotion over there i'm just gonna be quiet and it's also why I think I'm such a great listener, because I can be with people's suffering. So that was something that I saw, wow, like I'm at some level denying my own truth of like, hey, what you just said is really fucking hurtful and really mean and unnecessary. Um, so that was, that was quite revelatory for me recently, is that I can also have a voice and speak up in terms of what doesn't and does feel good. So that's, wow. that's a little extra notch on the belt of my own process to freedom. When do you feel like you claimed your golden voice? Because it is seven to your mother passed at seven. Yeah. And now I'm 27. <laughs> <laughs> so there's biologically someplace. <laughs> yeah. Somewhere in those 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're 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 aging well. Thank you very for, much. For yeah. 20, I'm 127. For, for 27. Actually. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm 108. So. Yeah. Exactly. Of course. Um, yeah. No. It's it's amazing. Like I felt like I did so much work 20 years ago, which is when I started my quote unquote career as a mind architect. Or, you know, so we're as I often say, we're all masterpieces, but works in progress. And I'm yeah. not. Uh, you know, I'm 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 not excluded from that, uh, as is recently evident. Well, we, we we share we share that that people pleasing gene, uh, that's a, that suppressive gene. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my my story as well. I think that you, um, you know, you architected yours much sooner than mine. Mine didn't even uh, open in terms of claiming my voice until forty two, mm -hmm. and prior to that, I was getting sick habitually. So I really understand how yeah. we can actually. How, how we can choose 
You know, mm-hmm. We can choose what occurs in our body. I want to speak about this notion around even compassion and empathy because you know it's one thing to be compassionate, but empathy comes from mm-hmm. actually like a shared suffering. A, 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 a yeah. share, a, a, it doesn't need to be the same suffering, but you had, um, if we may go there, and thank yeah. you for bringing your mother into it. And my mother is very central to my yep. story as well from that perspective in a in its own unique story. Uh, but you know, you had very um, traumatic um one was maybe slower one was um Mm -hmm. um sudden yeah um at seven and 17 yeah in terms of a deep level of 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 suffering yeah um uh and maybe you'd like to quickly just you know or just share a little bit about you know um where you were where when your mother passed of cancer and then your what happened with your father at age 17, as I understand the, the yeah. tragic accident on the ferry yeah. um, off of Dover. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, everybody's got their form of suffering and I don't consider myself to be special because of what I went through. You know, we, I don't think comparing each other to one another because of the degrees of suffering is very helpful. We all have our own customized curated path for what our soul requires. So for me, there was one of the, biggest stories that we all struggle with as humans the the illusion of loss right so Mm. i lived in that for a long time oh i'm so sorry for your loss and oh you lost your parents and so that was really subsequent actually to the events themselves the suffering was way more profound or um, impactful was because of the story of loss right so yeah my mom was dying for a while i was seven so and i'm sure for the couple of years prior to that like five six i you know, what, what do I know as a kid, right? Like it was just confusing. And as I said, I obviously learned some survival techniques of being the good boy and allowing my mom to have the attention and just hoping. That was another thing, like, you know, my feelings were very much commensurate with her state, right? Which I've also seen in life and especially in my own personal relationships. If someone's feeling good, I was like, okay, good, everyone's okay. If someone's feeling bad or upset, then there's a part of me that's like was more scared, right? And so that equally was a very profound thing to be able to transcend and go, oh, whatever they're going through, that's their experience. Like I'm, I, I can have empathy, sympathy, compassion, understanding, all the things for it, but I don't need to be sort of bound to their own emotions. Um, so that equally was quite, for me, liberating to see. But yeah, my dad, 17, of course, you think you know everything. Um, I was, I think, relatively humble, even at 17, but it was still super confusing. You know, dad goes to work, says, I love you. I say, I love you and see you tomorrow. No, you won't. <laughs> you know that. Yeah, that was very jarring. But I, again, I never got to really grieve it because it's when something is that shocking and you don't know how to cope with it you don't know how to process it um it really didn't manifest for me in terms of an emotional release until probably 12 14 years later so um when i really just did a lot of work and couldn't stop crying for a couple of hours realizing how much i miss my dad wow yeah it was pretty so it's you know and some people sadly go to the grave and they never process something right so i'm grateful for the fact that i at least had that um and that simultaneously and a few years prior to that i'd realized i'd never lost anything right my my parents died and i'm not saying that was great i wanted it but the narrative of loss is such a disservice to the fullness of who we are because it it implies there's something missing in you your life and that then that becomes an eternal sentence to suffering so this this notion of the disillusion of the illusion of loss yeah comes from realizing there is no nothing lost if we've if because it's it's alive inside us we are everything you know without getting too esoteric or woo woo or spiritual yeah. but like you know i am i am all of it and in the world of the manifest just through the laws of physics you know forms come and go they change right energy's conserved so okay the being that we could say was my mom and my dad the physical form is no longer here but to what degree is the essence still alive whether it be through me around me in my own thoughts and perceptions yeah. so yeah the story of loss is such a disservice to people because it becomes a justification for victimhood yeah. and that's not a story that I want to perpetuate for myself or anyone. No, oh. no. Oh. My um, my mother um, <clears throat> peacefully transitioned from a 
seven year Alzheimer journey. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the interesting things within that was for me and the deepening of my loving relationship with my mother that actually upon her peaceful transition even transcended mm -hmm. so deeply. Like I genuinely um, miss hearing her laugh and yet I feel her laughter. Yeah. Um, I miss her, the, her new puns, mm -hmm. and yet they live within me. The puns always run because it, and that was my mother. Yeah. You know, and, and so um, I really appreciate that notion around the, the disillusion of the illusion. Yeah. And of course, form, as I said, comes and goes. It's even sitting here for 20 minutes. Like the form of our own body is completely different. It yeah. doesn't look like it to the onlooker, but like cells, millions of them are dying. Like mm. we're literally you know, no offense, and I'm happy to pay housekeeping, but like I'm dropping cells all over the floor, right? You know, But thankfully, new ones are being born, and the degree to which we don't inhibit or interfere with that process is yeah. the degree to which we stay vital. Yeah. When we suppress and we hold energy, dis-ease is the precursor to disease, right? And mm -hmm. so the cells don't quite understand or they don't have the correct energetic signature to replicate in a way that is what intelligence wants, right? And this is how the cancers of the world develop, right? We're in a hostile environment internally mm. and no one, including a cell, wants to be in that. And so it's going to encourage more separation. So form is constantly changing. To what degree you can be in harmony with that, surrender to it. Uh, the absence of resistance, resistance mm. creating suffering and dis-ease is the degree to which you hopefully live a pretty vital and holistic and healthy life. Yeah. Well, even just the word you just said, like, I love how we can unpack and repack and reframe and reveal a word that realizing like this notion of like disease, it's simply ease Yeah. that we've chosen dis. Mm -hmm. And so it's a beautiful way. I really believe in the etymology of, of, of words. I and mean, what are some of your favorite words in terms of like an immediate reframe? Like I'll give you just a prompt as an example. For yeah. me, it's this notion of um, we're so focused on change. Mm -hmm. Ch you have to change. You have to. We Then it's, it's yeah. almost like I, I need to, right? And yeah. that suggests less than it. For me, what came up with this notion of change was this feeling of blame, right. this feeling of, of, of pain, this feeling of less than, this feeling of scarcity, mm -hmm. and this feeling like it was going to be a motherfucking steamship to get it from there to there. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was so beautiful to, uh, to, to just unpack this notion of reveal yeah like there's nothing to change we can just reveal and choose to heal because it's already inside us yeah and that that's an example i'd love to hear some of you because your 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 word architecture speaks directly to my soul I actually as i was writing some notes to my uh, to, to remind my mind I, I one of the things i wrote is like you're a clear-cut butcher to the soul Vegan, but vegan, but you know, like a clear cut, <laughs> no, right, right to, meat. right to the soul. You yeah, know? it's yeah, just yeah. like it's you see that 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 beautiful um, uh, clean cut, and that's what I really yeah. appreciate about your precision. You know, we we all, everyone here in this circle meets on this bridge of of nuance and meets on a bridge of like appreciation of like mm -hmm. that we are living a sensorial synesthetic. Mm -hmm experience mm -hmm. so um yeah there's so many words words are beautiful and sometimes i feel they fail me in terms of not having sufficient a lexicon because i'm sure there's so many words that would really like just complete an uh, experience or something that i wish to you know relay portray to somebody but i don't have access to right so i'm always like i said a work in progress myself and that includes language but i think even the different types of language right english versus you look at say something like sanskrit sanskrit uh, and you know if there are any sanskrit scholars out there they can perhaps correct me but from what i understand in my vedic studies and doing ayurveda sanskrit the words themselves they they were born from the frequency of the object that they spoke to mm. No, if you really get that, it's good. Like, so, you know, we say orange, and I have no clue what Sanskrit is for orange, but the, the vibration of the word is in keeping with, resonates, and is in alignment and commensurate with the frequency of what an orange is. Yes. That, to me, that's now when you get into the real alchemy of abracadabra, right? As I speak, so I create. So, and 
So there's no, to answer your question, there's no specific words. My, one of my favorites is what we just spoke to, dis-ease, right? Disconnect, dysfunction, discomfort, right? So it's the absence, it's the lack of. Mm -hmm. So disease is the, the accumulation over time. The only illusion is time, right? So there's many people out now who are not presenting with disease at all. You, they go see their doctor, they're like, oh, you're fine. Yeah. But the energetic expression of disease, the absence of ease that's living in every cell of their body based on the mind that they're living in, which is based in constraint because of the language that you're using of inadequacy and scarcity or some sense of insecurity is already a ticking time bomb, right? So that's one of my favorite words. Um, but just words themselves, like when you really understand that magic is that as I speak, so I create. As I cast spells, the words that I use are the precursor to the reality that I experience. We're not victims of circumstance, we're victims of perspective, and perspective is based in the language of the identity that I think I am. So really, all I am is I'm a slave to my own vibration. Yeah. And when you see that, it's like, holy shit, Like I don't need to change anything out there. Yeah, sure, you'd like to have a few more zeros in your bank account, perhaps a little less body fat, maybe a better looking partner, a bigger home, whatever it is that you think you want, but they're all precursors to the experience of a vibration that you think is on the other side of attaining them, which is actually who you already are. So you can short circuit the whole thing and realize, oh, I'm the very thing I'm looking for, but it's on the other side of the limiting language that I'm oblivious to that I identify with as who I am. And I love the, 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 the notion of what you've already spoken to, which is lean deeper into the triggers. If mm. something's triggered, that's, that's, actually, that's actually the doorway. That's the gateway. That's the, that's the leading in. Yeah. Talk the access to that, true yeah. freedom is to recognize where I'm not free. <laughs> I think it was on the backside of some sort of a plant or c ceremony that what, uh, what, what the universe you know, just sort of spoke to me was that no, you've been a prison of your own mind mm -hmm. and you're the warden holding the key to an unlocked cell Yeah, that never existed in the first place. Exactly. It's all illusory. I say, you know, what I like it writing in quotes, as you know, and I say you can't help but laugh when you realize the only thing that's been upsetting you is your own imagination. Exactly. So I printed some fun cards. It's like, uh -huh. a, little, like a little play, play card series. So Now we've got to create a deck. <laughs> New product. Wait, this is this is called rapid prototype. This is the this is the this is the, this is the Peter Peter Crohn Cronyisms. Peter Peter, Peter Cronyisms. Yes. <laughs> so the ultimate prism is fear. Prism. Pri, that's funny. The ultimate the prism, prism is fear. Right. <laughs> but it, 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 as it's written, let's let's honor the man. The ultimate prison is fear. Yeah. Let's talk about fear because this notion of um, uh -huh. of 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 fear. I mean, we've got we've had beautiful. Um, you know, reminder teachings, whether it's from Joseph Campbell or what have you, that you know, beautifully articulated, like that cave we most fear to enter holds our greatest treasure. How do we, in this modern day society, where fear is like can be gripping, mm -hmm. particularly what's happening around us? I mean, the world once again has become a little Kianoskatsik, right? Mm -hmm. That Indian word for out of balance, um, mm -hmm. and and. The harmony, yes, we, we get to be our own vertically aligned harmony, but this notion of fear, which is gripping right now. Yeah. How do we um, how do we see maybe the prism the prison into a prism? Yeah, I mean, what is the nature of a prison? What's the nature of fear? And I'm going to come back to the same thing we've just been discussing, which is its words, right? Fear is the manifest experience of the illusion of the constraint you're living in based in language. Yeah. Right, so fear, we, if it weren't for this sort of meat suit, this is sort of the screen a, a, upon which the projection of our own perspectives gets experienced. Yeah. Right, like if you walked into a theater, but there was no back wall and there was no screen, but they had the projector, you would never see the image. It was just sort of infinite and being projected. So fear is really the human experience that we get to have by virtue of this physical manifest form, which is really... The, the canvas upon which we get to see how am I viewing the world, right? Like I think Einstein, and I'm paraphrasing terribly, he said, you know, you either look at the universe as everything is, I forget what it was, or it's a miracle, right? It's not great. Every, you know, the universe is against you or everything is bad or an accident, but, or it's a miracle. And so fear really to me is, 
you know, again, one of my quotes, and I haven't used this one for a while, so I have to recall it from the dark recesses of my subconscious, but it's like, fears are the beacon, fear is the beacon that lights your path to freedom. Love that. Right? But it's human nature to resist fear, to avoid fear, to escape fear by whatever means, and there's obviously a myriad of substances and things that people use. But actually, just similar to what I was saying, is like the real access to freedom is to recognize where you're not free, while equally fear is the access to realizing where you don't understand your own divine nature. And so the more you can lean into fear, not necessarily like with will or toughness or being a survivor or a fighter, but really to see what is the illusion? What is the perceived threat? Where do I think that I'm not going to be okay here? Because fear is usually, it can be a present state, but invariably it's a future-based thought, right? future events appearing real as an acronym of fear, right? Where I'm like worried about something. I'm not going to be able to pay rent. My partner's going to leave me. I'm not going to be well. I'm going to be sick. My mom's going to die. There's this narrative that is based in an illusion of something that hasn't happened yet. As I say, most people are trying to avoid a bad future that hasn't occurred yet, mm. right? That's where the fear lives. So the antidote, you know, the, the way to mitigate fear is one, understand it, see the illusion of the threat. And then secondly, recognize to what degree am I actually not recognizing my eternal nature? Mm -hmm. That form comes and goes, as we discussed earlier, and that includes my surroundings, my finances, my relationships, my possessions, but I will remain complete. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that I can lose, and for that reason, there's literally nothing to fear. Hey there, Golden Ones. Are you tired of settling for clothes that lack soul, style, and purpose? Well, We've got something for you with One Golden Thread. It's time to upgrade your wardrobe with One Golden Thread, the brand that's redefining fashion and making a positive impact on the planet. I'm Jeff Skult, founder and designer. With One Golden Thread, you're not just buying clothes, you're planting seeds of change. Every purchase contributes to planting a tree, helping to restore our precious environment and create a brighter future for generations to come. And don't take my word for it. Read the reviews. The clothing isn't just stylish, it's versatile and inclusive. Whether you're hitting the gym, meeting friends for coffee, or chilling at home, One Golden Thread's designs effortlessly blend comfort, functionality, and sophistication. But what truly sets us apart is our golden ethos. A commitment to living life to the fullest while embracing regenerosity and connection with the world around us. So why settle for ordinary when you can elevate your style and make a difference? Visit OneGoldenThread.com today and join the movement towards a more conscious and golden way of living. One Golden Thread, <laughs> because life's too short for anything less. And hey, because why not? Here's a first time checkout love code from me, deeper than anything you will find elsewhere, drops of gold. Find your sexy and soulful golden thread self at One Golden Thread. Drops of Gold is your go-to code. Guaranteed you will like it. Try it, buy it, love it. And if you don't, just return it. No questions asked. You are golden. We are all connected as One Golden Thread. You know, one of the drops of gold that touches my heart is revere fear there's gold in there mm -hmm. and um one of yours that you you speak to which is so beautiful which is this notion of whatever you fear is not out there it's in you yeah which speaks to this notion of like if we can be if we can if we can let go of the as we let go of the resistance to mm -hmm. ourselves, we let go of the resistance that resides inside because it's inside you it's yeah. not that thing out there yeah that's that feels like something that, um, I mean, what I what I love about, I mean, knowledge is what we receive and what we hoard. Wisdom is what we embody and and what we, and what we infuse and what we share with mm -hmm. our with ourselves first. And what I love about about the um, the digestible, the accessible, mm -hmm. and the dissolution of the wisdom that 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 is. Um, you know, there's your lucid dreaming that you put into words and you do soundscapes around and we do clothing now and all of the things, which is like, you know, I believe that the, the, like the codes are alive inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and then you don't, we don't need to 
talk about it. We don't even need to do it. We can just be it. Mm-hmm. And that to me is like a world truly of living life golden. Yeah. Yeah, that's freedom, right? And I tell people again, one of my catchphrases, I can't give you something you don't already have. But what I can do is remove Virgo. what's <laughs> what I can do is remove what's in the way of you realizing that, right? And that's that's priceless, right? So again, it's the image of like that David that's being chipped away at from the outside. There's no becoming of something. It's the dissolution or the unbecoming of who you've been misidentified with that's based in some sort of limitation. And that's where the fear is. Fear ultimately is based on the predominant human state, which is the illusion of separation. Mm. And as long as you think you're separate from other, from source, from the divine, then you have to, by the you know, by the laws of even of the second laws of thermodynamics, like when there's this separation, there's atrophy, because you're no longer part of the, 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 the one, the whole. And so it's immediate, right? Being separate is commensurate with having to survive. So if you're separate from the whole, then whatever it is, everything's a potential threat. So you, as soon as you're separate, then fear is instantaneous. But if I'm held, if I'm part of everything, then there's nothing to survive anymore. One of my last supper invitations at the table, if we can play the game where they can be alive or transition... Sure. is Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the lesson of the blessing of what interbeing, which is the, the order that he coined, ironically enough, in the year of my birth in 1965, is this notion that everything ultimately connects, mm-hmm. that there are precepts where really obliterating the greatest lie, which is the illusion of, which is the, which is disillusion of the illusion of separation. Yeah. And it's not just even that notion around the separation between us, it's that separation between nature and one is us, mm-hmm. which to me is like the most gorgeous thing. And as, as a human who mm-hmm. who has chosen to live in nature, you know, what, how does that land for you in terms of this notion of connection to self by connection to nature and realizing that that there is that there is no separation between the two? I mean, it's cliche right but everyone's like get more time in nature put your feet on the soil go and walk in the forest like i think nature is such a beautiful teacher and i'm learning that more and more uh, certainly over the last few months but it's it's i was gonna say it's uncontaminated it's become somewhat contaminated by humans unfortunately but it's it's the most authentic expression of what is whereas humans based on fear the illusion of separation have become we masquerade, right? Like we, mm. we adorn the facade and the pretense that we think is going to garner the love and acceptance we so definitely crave because we don't have it for ourselves. And so humans play this game of manipulation, not always malintent, but sometimes, but usually it's just a child through the innocence of not feeling accepted enough or loved. I'm going to be the sexy girl, the powerful, wealthy man as you know, stereotypical archetypes to try and garner that. So, but nature doesn't give a shit. <laughs> Nature's like, no, I'm here. And you're there and I don't judge you. So that's why just being in nature, there is that, there's the relinquishment of any particular facade, guard, or barricade that humans create because yeah. of the feeling again of fear that this particular tribe, this particular community, this particular office, this particular yoga class or community is not going to accept me. What people don't recognize is you felt that before you even entered the space. Hmm. So is it they're not accepting you or are you living in the energy of lack of self-acceptance, right? Whereas in nature, there isn't any of that. Hmm. So it's sort of the real life remembering and the reminder of the fact that, you know, in the absence of the idea of yourself, there is no fear, there is no separation and there's nothing to overcome. Hmm. I've... um chosen to live a life of seeing possibility and and i truly do believe in solutions versus problems and what have you and yet the world has some big problems right now and that kind of goes against your belief but that's okay 
This is what I'm saying. Is like, I mean, what, I mean well, thank you. It, it does go. Well, well we, no, if we're going to be powerful. Actually, it does, you know what? No, I really appreciate you saying. I, I'm just yes, calling you out. Yeah. I appreciate you calling me up. Mm -hmm. Because in that moment, I will tell you that in the last month, I'm not saying that, that, that there's a nihilisticness mm -hmm. to my consciousness. Yeah. But there is a sense of, um, of like, how do we get out of this mess? Yeah. Um, because, you know, um, I was supposed to be in the Middle East on October 11th. Um, and dear friends, um, uh, which includes Kat Benzova, who's here with us today, and, and, and really a few, other, a few other friends, we, um, we went to the RISE gathering in outside of Las Vegas and had the most extraordinary heart opening moment of writing intentions on eco lanterns and sending a mm -hmm. thousand lanterns into the sky. And, mm -hmm. um, on the three lanterns that I had, I wrote, a, a, um, an intention for self community and planet. Mm -hmm. And as the literally, I mean, it's, it's, as the script of life goes, as the lanterns were rising to the sky, we were in this most exuberant of the of the grand possibility of it all, mm -hmm. um, and seeing the magic. What was happening um, in terms of the massacre, that music festival was yeah. unfolding at the same time. Right. And what has happened since then has been. Um, decisions and actions where almost it's toxic masculinity would be the way that I would view what's what's some of what's go, what's going yeah. on in terms of decisions and and for me what what what, what comes through and it's this is um, a poem a spoken word piece that 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 just came through which is don't we realize the lie in disguise that as we so rigidly choose sides, our hearts become desensitized, the suffering of the other side rationalized. Mm -hmm. And can't we now see the truth that we get to meet on the bridge of a C2 and to see that there's no sides to choose, there's only one choice to choose, and that's love, virtue. Mm -hmm. and, and yet what <clears throat> has been hard, challenging on my heart Mm -hmm. um, is that um, I believe that love trumps hate. I believe it. Mm -hmm. And it's not even belief because I believe it's within every belief is L-I-E, which is a lie. So I, mm -hmm. it's not about a belief. It's just like a deep knowing yeah. of what I feel. Um, and yet it's been polarizing. So even in that moment where you called me up just now and I said, we have a problem. Yeah. Like I'd want to say like we have an opportunity. And I will tell you yeah. that, that I'm angry. Like mm -hmm. there's an there is there is an uh, there is an anger in me that 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 I'm expressing, mm -hmm. and and that's coming from this place of we had as a humanity an incredible moment to look and stare hate right in the eye on October eighth, mm -hmm. and as a human community to go back into our humanness around mm -hmm. the world and come together and say like that's not who we are. Mm -hmm. We will dismantle that. Mm -hmm. We as humanity, not sides, but we as humanity, mm -hmm. and come into our humanness. Mm -hmm. I saw the pandemic as a beautiful reset. Yeah. Like I see that I'd love to hear what you're feeling and what mm -hmm. are some invitations and invocations that we can offer to listeners who may feel unexpressed, who may feel suppressed, who may feel um, uh, hopeless. Yeah, there's a lot there, right? So I think. The first, the first thing I want to speak to is when you said you were supposed to be in the Middle East, right? On whatever day, the 11th of October, I think you said whatever. So if you look at the languaging even, like what would be the first thing you recognize in that? It sounds like a, a should or an obligation as opposed to it was an invitation. It was a blessing. I was, I was, and beyond that, yeah. you weren't supposed to be there. How do we know that? Because you weren't, <laughs> right? Yeah. So when you really get that, it's powerful, right? Because so there's resistance in your system, however subtle. You might not be yeah. massacring or beheading, but you're carrying resistance of, I was supposed to be somewhere and I wasn't. That's Now you're in conflict with reality. Yeah. However minor, and there's obviously a sliding gradient. 
But that's where we can recognize, as the old African proverb says, you know, if there's no enemy within, the enemy without can do us no harm. Right? So, just as I was saying earlier, this meat suit upon which we get to see kind of like the canvas of our own thoughts get manifest, well, then if we look at it on a societal level, a global level, whatever seeming problems or certainly immense amount of suffering, stuff that I don't condone, that's abhorrent, that's disgusting, and all the words that we can use, at some level is really the projection of the current state of ignorance that humans carry because of the unknowing of their true nature. Right? Even the fact that people identify with a religion is going to be a hot topic for people. Nobody is a religion. When someone says, I'm Christian, I'm Buddhist, I'm Hindu, I'm Muslim, no, you're not. And by all means, choose, if it's consciously, please, a dogma that you subscribe to. You could choose to live a life of Christianity, but you, the being, are not Christian. A baby doesn't even know its name, let alone its nationality or any particular uh, religious affiliation. So when we start to become associated with, misidentified with these labels, then if I'm one thing and you're another, we're just perpetuating the very form of fear that we discussed earlier, which is the illusion of separation. Yes. So until that's actually reconciled and understood, the mitigation of ignorance, and I don't mean ignorance as a judgment, but really the absence of knowing, then there is no resolution. There is no peace. Again, one of my quotes, I say, you can't create well, peace when people are at war within themselves. Yes. So even that subtle shift of like, I wasn't supposed to be there. Why? Because I wasn't. And to find peace, that's an expression yeah. of harmony and peace, which is the precursor to a world of peace. Why? Because Jeff's at peace. Mm -hmm. And that's very hard because it really calls to surrender and a deeper trust that in ways that I don't understand, my life is unfolding precisely in the way that I've curated for my own liberation. But as long as we're in this very egotistical self, like the audacity of the ego that thinks it knows how things should be, and how other people should act, that's, that's war waiting to happen consistently. Mm. So what, is the, what actually is the invitation of you within this golden mic moment um, or to share a message with each human, everyone by one who would be receiving it for them to look inside and realizing that we can decalcify? What would be the, the, the how-to start it's the dissolution of every misidentified label that you think you are that is in any way different to anybody else yeah mm -hmm. as i was telling friends yesterday it gives me chills i said in the absence of all personal stories all you're left with is i love you i might be the golden mic drop right there <laughs> um you're speaking about identity, mm -hmm. which is really extraordinary, which is um, like, I love the words I am. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. And mm -hmm. yet sometimes within I am, there can be <clears throat> that white knuckle clutching into identity mm -hmm. instead of like, I feel. Um, mm -hmm. what, is, what, is, what does I am mean to you? It's the root upon which everything that we identify as is born. If I am not good enough, then I will live in a world of confinement and perhaps some sort of compensation or adaptation to become mm. a people pleaser, a perfectionist, or work harder. If I live within a world of I'm not wanted, then I might become a drug addict who lives on the streets just so that I can reinforce and be right about my own perspective, right? The ego's number one prerogative is to be right about its own identity, mm. no matter how limiting that identity is. That's the madness. I'll prove to you that I can fuck up my life just so that I can be right about the narrative that wasn't even consciously chosen. So when you see that, so that is the dissolution of the idea of myself in the absence of the narrative that I am something that is a limitation or a negation of myself, then what am I left with? That's why I said in the absence of all personal stories, all you're left with is I am love. I, I, I love you because who I am is love. If I'm not identified as not enough, not wanted, not safe, I'm a religion that you're not. I'm a nationality that you're not. I'm a wealth bracket that you're not. If all of that's gone because it's all dialogue, then all there is is the unity of the love that we are at the deepest level. 
So that's the invitation. It's the dissolution. It's the unbecoming. It's the recognizing that I'm not my story. I'm not my narrative. I'm not this form. I'm not my bank account. I'm not my job. I'm not my corner office. Really, I'm a spiritual being having a human experience and by all means have whatever form of human experience is appropriate for your own emancipation. But underneath it all, namaste. <laughs> namaste go. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think about the, uh, this, this uh, appreciation of the human condition is the scarcity of the human uh, experience is love and the human experiment mm -hmm. is the dissolution of the good and the bad and just seeing both and, 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 and holding them both in, in the highest. And we, you know, I, I love what you said is this notion of I am. Well, it's your choice to choose. If you're, if you're choosing to see something from a scarcity <laughs> perspective, that will lead. If you're choosing something from a abundant perspective, mm -hmm. that's a beautiful I am. Yeah. And so I'd love to ask you, what does I am freedom mean to you? Yeah, so just one little adjustment there. It's not a choice. It's only a choice when it is, right? So choice can be literal or figurative. So it's figurative choice. Oh, well, you can just choose. Like if you don't like your life and you're sick, that's your choice. But that creates a lot of disempowering and victimhood mindset. It's very judgmental. You can't choose beyond the limits of your current awareness. Now, when you get that, it really breeds a lot more compassion, right? So you can't be held accountable for that which you're oblivious to. Mm -hmm. That at least gives people the permission to be in their blind spots without any sort of judgment or feeling of, you know, lack of self-worth because, oh, I'm sick because I got cancer because of my own fault. That, that's perpetuating cancer, right? So it breeds a little bit more understanding and compassion for the human condition, which is you only can see as far as your current state of awareness. As you expand that, fine, you have more choice. But choice is also infinite, right? Yeah. So the I am freedom to me, why that is such a powerful statement is because it's the impersonal expression of what we seek personally, right? So most people, even the most spiritually elite might say, oh, I am free, nothing bothers me anymore. But what they are missing, as far as I'm concerned, is that there's still the I. Mm. And the I is the barrier, albeit as subtle as, you know, the inability to impregnate life if you have some sort of contraception use <laughs> the the i is the condom that keeps you separate from like the infinite expression of creation so the i am free that's great have at it but the impersonal the most powerful expression is i am freedom itself that's the transcendence even of the i i'm the expression of freedom which contains both me, but then it's also an invitation for everybody to join me. If I'm free, it's like, well, I don't know about you, you're fucked, but I feel great. That equally isn't like a resolution of yeah. harmony for world peace or, but if I am freedom, mm. that's an open invitation for you to join me and perhaps see the same in yourself. Mm. It's an impersonal expression of the essence of the soul that's always been there that arises in the absence of the idea of myself that was based in limitation. So speaking of limitations, you say that we cannot expand beyond our current awareness. Correct. And so what I'm receiving from your um, from following following the thread here is that is that if loving awareness or if love is the ex the, the regenerative language, if love is the expression, then by simply going into love you can expand your awareness. What are is that is that the, is that the way for humanity to expand their awareness and therefore expand their um, their life and their livelihood and uh, finances and all the things in between? It's one way, and again, it depends how you define love. For some people, they get confused with the "you completes me"s and the romantic connotation of love, right? So mm -hmm. for me, love is all embracing. It doesn't have an agenda. It's all accepting. It's godlike. So that's one way for sure, but I think the real way to get to that place of freedom and the emancipation of your own sense of constraint is that you have to go through, quote unquote, the cauldron of your own existence as yeah. the perceived human that you think you are. So everything that's currently happening in the world is really the expression of the collective form of lack, scarcity, inadequacy, insecurity just being manifest in abhorrent ways. It doesn't condone the behavior. You know, the man who's beating up on his wife or his kids I'd, I'd be the first to interfere and stop that. But if you understood how he was conditioned based on the fact that his father and his high school teacher did the same to him, there's an understanding, there's a compassion, right? Yeah. So he has to get through the fact that he's going to be, you know, have a restraining order. He's going to get divorced, the suffering that he has to go through. There's no, there's no silver bullet, you know, like 
you, it's sort of what's in the way is on the way, right? That expression of like, we try to avoid the challenges, but the, as I said earlier, fear is sort of the, the beacons that light the path to freedom. And so we, there's no spiritual bypassing, unfortunately, mm. you know, and what we're seeing in the world right now, as hard as it is to see, as tragic it is, is as, as, as seemingly evil and heinous, it's nonetheless at some level, it's the reconciliation of all of the dis-ease that's been suppressed and hidden and denied and the ignorance that's associated with it coming to the forefront. It's like a collective cancer that is manifesting in a tumor in different areas and hopefully through the collective recognizing wait a minute this doesn't make sense like there's some sort of intelligence that now can surpass the ignorance that's allowed for the disassociation and the feelings of separation and the justification of harm and abuse whether it be in a little home right now in los angeles somewhere or it's sort of the mass destruction and genocide that we're seeing it's it's the same energy mm. and so really what is the answer what is the work you become free in yourself. Mm. You discover freedom and the love that is your inherent nature. You be peace. Because yeah. if we are collectively the expression of everyone's individual essence, then if I shift, if I can reconcile even that little bit of I was supposed to be in the Middle East, a benign story of you telling something that nonetheless carries the energy of resistance, however inf in infinitesimal, yeah is still a contributing factor to the energy of resistance and hostility in the world. Mm. But if who I am is in harmony with life, I am so in the place of gratitude and acceptance and surrender in ways that even for me personally may not be what I currently want. But if I can at least remove the resistance, then I'm equally mitigating the resistance as part of the collective that would manifest as war or abuse. That's extraordinary. As we're wrapping up, you know, one of my favorite you know, um, acknowledgements I'd just like to honor by seeing you is that there are those that can shore esoterically, philosophically, woo-woo guru, but you fucking bring it down to the brass tacks of like the highest performers in the world that are doing things that we can dream about because we watch it on TV <clears> and <throat> mm -hmm. we assume that those people are robotic. We assume that those people mm -hmm. have this ability like, oh, they have no... Mm -hmm. They have no thoughts because they are that precision athlete or what have you. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to share a story that, mm -hmm. that touches you in terms of, of that, that, that somebody giving themselves self-permission to shift and pivot based upon a reframe of their mind, of the architecture and something sure. that touches you. Yeah, I mean, one of the most I've had, you know, the opportunity to work with so many high-end performers in different areas, but the one that was really speaks to the embrace of our humanity was, and actually the precursor to that athlete winning the MVP of the whole National League and Major League Baseball, right, yeah. which is an honor that very few humans have, um, was because he was struggling and he had a bunch of strikeouts, which obviously as a hitter, being an offensive player is not good. You don't want that, right? You want to get hits. And it was creating this accumulation of dis-ease, frustration, anger, all the things that we can understand when we're not getting what we want, right? It's the mm -hmm. adult version of a kid's tantrum because you didn't buy the toy that they wanted, right? In this case, he's not getting hits and he's being paid millions of dollars to do that. It's yeah. embarrassing. It's unfulfilling, all the things. And it was such a beautiful conversation because, as you've noticed, I like to bring, or I do bring a lot of humor because I think we tend to you know, make everything way more significant than it is in this illusion of being human in, in the first place. But so I said to him, you know, he was frustrated. I think it'd been four, maybe five games where he'd really scuffled and hadn't had a hit. And I said, oh yeah, that sucks because you're obviously the only player in the whole league who's not getting hits, right? <laughs> you know, like the baseball is a game of failure. You're the best in the world. You're still missing seven out of 10, right? <laughs> So it's just an invitation to realize what, what are you like? You're supposed to be hitting every, like you've got a guy on the mound who's being paid the same amount, maybe even more than you because he's really fucking good at what he does. And he's going to be trying to make sure that you don't hit it, right? Like that beautiful tug of war, the yin and the yang between a pitcher and a hitter. And so he found a little bit of relief in realizing that it was sort of asinine for him to think that even as one of the best players in the league, he shouldn't be missing, right? And so it was such a beautiful conversation because he's the ardent professional. He's so disciplined. He's so dedicated. He's revered in the sport for being one of the biggest, 
you know, com- sort of most dedicated professionals, right? There's a lot of guys who have talent and they get away with it and whatever they do to, you know, offset their fears, whether it be substances and God knows what, but he's, he's, he's the ardent professional. And so for him, it wasn't that he needed to work harder. He didn't need to like dedicate more time to batting practice. He didn't need to get a nutritionist or spend more time in the gym. Mm-hmm. The discipline he needed was to accept his humanity. And it's one of my favorite quotes from Jack Nicholas, greatest golfer of all time. He said that one of the most important parts of winning is being okay losing. Mm. And it gives me chills because I love working with athletes and I love sports because in the moment that you're okay with what I tell a lot of my athletes, if you're okay with every outcome, you've got nothing to lose. But see, the human disposition is people consciously but predominantly unconsciously aren't okay with a lot of outcomes. And it's that resistance to the possibility of everything that creates the absolute in inhibition of ex- accessing potential. Because if I'm not okay with anything, then it's an avoidant energy. That avoidant energy is sitting within me, which is the, it is the suffocation of my own potential. So in that moment, what happened is he embraced his humanity. He recognized that not only can he not avoid striking out, but striking out is an inherent part of the game. The game is based in failure. Again, you get three out of 10, you're a Hall of Famer as a hitter. It's That's about right. 300, right? That's right. So he, that, for that moment, there was the release. There was the real freedom. And I'm going to actually piggyback one other story that was one of my favorites. It's still in baseball. but So he then went on to have an extraordinary season. I think he bat like 320 or something, which was you know one of the highest, maybe the highest in the league, became the MVP. But it was not because I told him, try harder, don't do this, avoid this. It was, no, I want you to integrate your capacity to fail. And so there was no longer the avoidant energy, which was creating resistance, which as an athlete means your timing is off. You're already at the plate in the case of a hitter trying to avoid something. Like one of my free throw shooters for the NBA, he had the worst free... So there's two stories I want to piggyback because I love sports, but he had the worst free throw average in the league, 37%. The average is like 75. And so I asked, well, when you step up to the line, how are you feeling? He's like, well, you know, I'm nervous and I'm trying not to miss. See, when we're trying to do something that we don't want, then the brain can't distinguish. It's sort of still focused on that. You don't come to a T-junction and go, I don't want to go right. You know, if you know where you're going, then you have a sense of direction. And so in that conversation with this guy who, you know, I hugged him when I arrived, I was like looking at his belly button. (laughs) I'm not sure. But it was such a beautiful moment because this little kid came to the forefront where I said, well, if I told you that for the rest of the season you shot league average, like how would you feel? And his face lit up. He's like, dude, that would be amazing. There's a bit of disbelief there because of the past hurt of not performing well. Again, I say past hurt informs future fear. So his suffering had now been superimposed into the future of now I don't want something. Mm-hmm. But I said, so you'd feel amazing. He's like, yeah. And I said, how would you feel in your body? It's like, oh God, I feel so relaxed. Like there's nothing, who cares? There's nothing to lose. I'm like, well, that is the energy by which you as a natural athlete get to perform in a way that is, it's effortless. And I said, here's the difference is like, we're still sitting in your kitchen, right? I've just got a better imagination in the way that I'm casting and creating a future for you to step into, which is inspiring versus resistant or avoidant. And then the last story with baseball, it was my first season in baseball. So I didn't know much about the sport, but I knew a lot about the way that people were or weren't performing. And this one guy who was, he was he was, a, I mean, baseball players are big, but my other guy who was the MVP is a first baseman. He's like solid. He probably has about 30 plus homers, home runs a year. Smaller utility guys, short stops and stuff like that. They might get six to seven. This guy, kind of middle of the round, 12 to 16 would be a good season, right? He's not one of the power hitters, but he's solid. But he'd gone almost the span of a whole season, albeit across two seasons. So sort of the last three months of one season and now we're two months into the next season. He hadn't had a home run. So you know, 85% through a season, albeit split across two years, hadn't had a home run. So he's getting jested, he's getting picked on. He's, you know, guys, don't worry, you're not a power hitter. Like, you know, the energy within the locker room amongst men is it's pretty brutal. So it was really getting to him. And I remember he called me from the car park of the, of the field. This is like three or four hours before a game. And he's really frustrated and I get it. And I said, what if I told you that for the rest of your career, and he had probably another five to six years, you never hit another home run for the rest of your career. Could you be okay with that? 
Now, an athlete being paid probably five, seven million, whatever, and probably was going to make more as he continued. That was a really, really hard thing for him to hear. And of course, the instantaneous reaction, no, of course, like, no, I can't do that. Like, I'm not, that's not what I'm paid for. It's not what I want. But it was the energetic invitation for him to let go of a future fear that was creating the resistance, which was the precursor to him not getting the results he wanted. So he eventually got to a yes to the answer of my question. Could you be okay? For the rest of your career, you never hit a home run. And in the reconciliation and the mitigation and the release of the resistance of a future that he was trying to avoid, meaning he suddenly became okay with every possibility, I could feel the shoulders drop in his car and I wasn't even there. Right? The freedom that he felt. This was done over the phone. This is just over the phone. Four hours later, it was we were playing the Cardinals. It was the diamond against diamondbacks against the Cardinals. His second at bat. The text he sent me that night, like it, it like hairs on my skin are standing up. Right? <laughs> what was the text? I, I don't remember the words, but it was like a kid who just like, I don't know, discovered sex for the first time. <laughs> it's like, that was the most extraordinary experience. He said, I didn't even try. Yeah. Yeah. So that was for me, one of the most beautiful moments of recognizing the power of avoidance and how that can stop us, ironically, from actually receiving, attaining, creating, attracting the very thing that we think we want. I remember back in 2015, there was a, a young couple at the time, dear friends of mine, that had like this effortless relationship. And, and I asked Amanda, it was Amanda and Chris Lane, I asked Amanda, I said, what's the key to your relationship with Chris? Mm -hmm. And she says, I have no expectations of Chris. Mm -hmm. So I'm surprised and delighted every time. Mm -hmm. And it feels like that's hearkening back to like this chills that you just got of him like being his inner child hitting a home run like it's his first time. Yeah. And he wasn't, he, he let that go. What, it's, it's such a powerful thought to go because it, and you're inviting people to go so deeply into what they're not expecting from you which is like like to let go mm -hmm. of the outcome i know that one of your favorite teachers is this um uh the gentleman who had the quote i don't mind how this is going to uh turn yeah. out yeah this is my secret i don't mind what happens krishnamurti yeah that's freedom and it's subtle, right? Because I think for a lot of people, they might hear that and it seems like resignation almost like, oh, well, who cares? Like in that, again, as an athlete, as having worked with hundreds of athletes, that's one of the expressions I hear a lot is they say, God damn, you know, when things aren't going well, I wish I didn't care so much. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's quite the antithesis. It's actually, no, I want you to care more. But your care has to supersede your worry. Care is heart-centered. They care about this. They can't. You've been playing baseball, golf, you know, whatever sport it is since you were three, four years old. You care more about your sport probably than your spouse, with all due respect, you know. But when you worry and you drift into your head because there's expectations, there's past failures, trials and tribulations that you're wanting to not, you know, repeat. Now you're in a state of ego and you're ironically actually manifesting the very thing that you're trying to avoid. Whereas if you stay in the love, you stay in the passion, you stay in the acceptance, which is really a rule for life, similar to you talking about that couple, where there's no expectation. Yeah. It is the pure nature of life itself, which is uncertainty and maintaining the curiosity and childlike wonder and awe that we have when we arrived of like, wow, let's see where this goes. Full circle back to the golden child. Yeah. Uh, I would love to invite us to complete this with a little spoken word by you. Oh, really? Put me right at the spot. <laughs> if something, if something's coming through, spoken word. I mean, I think the whole conversation has been spoken word. It's, it's true. <laughs> I mean, I, there were a couple of moments I said, "Wow, that was pretty cool." What I just said. I can't wait to get someone to record that. Or Fortunately, make notes from the recording. I often say that. Thank you, Josh Robertson. Yeah. No, I think. Uh, I mean, you know, I'll share a poem that I wrote recently. Uh, well, I didn't write recently. I wrote it many, many moons ago. But I shared it with someone recently because it was appropriate to share. So it's not really spoken word. It's a poem. But yeah. um, such a one do I remember whom to look at is to love. To have lived forever within one's mind and yet so briefly by one's side. Oh, for a life of sensation rather than of thought. 
<laughs> when you share that, what comes through for you? Because that that's obviously an amalgamation of a lot of of yeah. universes um, uh, infinitely coming together. Yeah, well, what to me that sort of in a beautiful summary of our whole conversation invites people to consider is don't live in your head, live in your life. To have lived within one's mind forever and yet so briefly by one side, oh, for a life of sensation rather than of thought. <laughs> Get in the dirt, feel it all. That's the access to freedom. Peter Crow, you were golden. Back at you, my friend. Thank you for being here. This is... Uh... Yeah, I mean, if there is, is there anything you'd like to ask me in closing? Anything you'd like to? Um, should you have been in the Middle East? <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm> just... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This is no. I'm just so grateful for this conversation, the collaboration we're doing. Mm. Um, you know, sort of. Yeah, I just love what you're a stand for, mm. and the fact that our paths crossed in this sensorial experience that I'm enjoying of being human and the fact that you're one of the beings that I've curated as part of my path and I'm just very grateful for that and what we get to now share and this beautiful project we're creating together and hopefully people adorn the the garments that you wove and that I foresaw have have the experience of being freedom themselves well it, it's it's a beautiful thing it feels good to it feels good to feel this good yeah, and it feels good to wear a message that you're sharing with others, and I and I love the message that's also tucked inside. So yeah, this yeah. is uh, we get to complete to continue, and and, and this is going to be a beautiful, yeah. a beautiful garden. And I appreciate, um, you know, this for me is what we're doing here is is as deeply quartered in my soul as 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 the clothes and the codes, and mm -hmm. because I. Um, uh, the fact that we get to remember, yeah. The fact that we get to release, the mm -hmm. fact that we get to reveal and reframe and to come into this version of self. And I love what you said. It's like you know, just be embodied, you know, mm -hmm. and, and and be here now. And and um, so, yeah. I uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll complete this by reading. We'll, we'll exit by by you choosing. One of your cards. One of my own quotes. One of your own quotes. And, from and, the and, and to, deck and, that is not available yet on Amazon, <laughs> but apparently we will be creating. <laughs> Let's go this way. Let's go. Stop for a moment, take a breath, and ask yourself, can I be at peace with the way things are right now? <laughs> I will give you one reflection, and then I will read one of yours, and you give a reflection. Sure. So... My favorite human was my grandmother, Emily. Mm -hmm. And whenever I had any any inner angst as a young boy, and I had a lot of inner angst in mm -hmm. terms of the, what was suppressed inside, mm -hmm. she would say to me, um, whatever you're feeling inside, I want you to fast forward 365 days to next year at this exact moment. Do you think that you would even remember mm -hmm. what you're feeling inside on this day 365 days ago because if not it's not yours let it go right beautiful so, that's a beautiful expression okay okay i get to go this, Pick is, one. A, this is the new peter crone game where peter Van Deck. available in 2024 at a good bookstore near you <laughs> um <laughs> do they even have bookstores anymore forget that just go online <laughs> yeah go to petercrone.com this is where you can find me by the way and join oh, freedom. This is a good one. You're either living from ego or you're living from soul. Mm hmm Yeah, I mean, it sort of summarizes what I've spoken to here and what we've discussed, right? If you're in the worry in the head, the identity, the misidentification of who you think you are, then everything has to, by default, be based in some form of survival, mm -hmm. trying to make it in life. Versus from the soul, when you live from the essence of who we are, there's nothing missing. I am everything. I am that which I seek. Mm. The trouble is, when you're in the ego, it's like 
you can't see the soul, so to speak. There, it's like it reminds me of a funny line from Groucho Marx where I don't know what the movie was, but I remember the line. It was so funny and very him where a gentleman comes up to him and asks for directions. He says, you can't get there from here. <laughs> right? Which is so beautiful because it's sort of like when you're in the ego, you can't get to the soul from here because when you're in the ego, it's the blind spot. Yeah. Now, of course, you can, but there needs to usually be some form of inspiration, a catalyst for you to be jolted out and go, oh, I'm not that. Mm. And yet, I that is a part of me. So, mm. And this last one is, you can read it because this is from the deck also coming out in 2024, 2025. This is Drops of Gold from Jeff Skult. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, play, pray, pray. And... It's spelled... Yes, the distinction between pray, P-R-E-Y, and pray, P-R-A-Y. Yeah. So what comes up for me in, in this notion is, uh, and I will share a spoken word piece that was inspired in in the presence of one of my creative partners, Kat mm. Benzova, mm -hmm. which, um, which was really a blessing of like, <clears throat> well, how do we be our fullest expression? Mm -hmm. And what came through that was this, that in this and every, each and every moment, we get to choose to start to give zero fucks mm -hmm. about anyone else's opinions of you, mm -hmm. to clear the decks for our infinite fucks, mm -hmm. which is our transcendent truth. No more woo-woo, no more gurus, because we are each spirit full mm -hmm. over spiritual, because the gold already resides inside you. You say yes to life with no hesitation and reservation to free dive into the unknown beyond your comfort zone expectations it's each our personal choice to claim our golden voice it's all time we share our gift with increased ignition when in doubt get out while embracing the beautiful mystery of the magical journey of life's mystery we are each more liberated and free together than apart because we know each moment is to choose to live from an open heart and we each keep our eyes on all the blessings because we know residing inside that deepest dark fear cave shines our deepest soul lessons. And most importantly, we will never forget, just like Scooby-Doo, this is all supposed to be fun. So yes, fuck yes, let's have some. Mm -hmm. Amen. Peter Crone, thank you so much for being on Drops of Gold. It's an honor and a blessing. And uh, thank you, thank you. Thank really you, sir. appreciate Seth. you. Go back to the ah. Well, you got to Sparta. Do it. Sparta. Okay, golden ones. Thank you for being on this episode of Drops of Gold. The special code for you, as a reminder, is Drops of Gold at checkout for one golden thread. Twenty-two percent off gift off purchase. Your threads. Enjoy your journey. You are golden, and we are all connected as one golden thread. Enjoy your threads. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being with us on Drops of Gold. Produced by Mark Shapiro and Josh Robertson. Music by Josh Robertson and Chazier. I'm your host, Jeff Skult. And remember, in this moment and this moment's forward, remember to always pull on your golden thread and find your truth in this now reality. Thank you for being with us. You are golden. Enjoy your journey. <laughs>